right guys, hi. So we're back to the miracle worker. We are on act two officially. So this whole week, you're just doing act two, um, the first half. So in our book, I'm cutting off the first act, uh, or the second act, first part of the second act on page 62, about halfway down. So um, when we get there, we will go through it, but I'm gonna split this into two videos so that you guys can watch a little and then take a break and then watch a little more. I don't want you to have to like run through this like super fast. So what that means is you do still have to do these fun little lead puzzles that everyone loves so much. Um, but you'll have all week to get this whole section done. So it's the same sort of timeline as we would be doing if you were reading um, at home. Like you'd have a whole week to do the set number of pages. But I'm going to post this Monday and then you'll have till the next Monday to get the whole thing done. So don't feel like you have to rush. It is the whole week long assignment. So let's get started, shall we? All right, so we are on page 41, act two, starting the whole thing. Here we go. It is evening. The only room visible in the Keller house is Annie's, where by lamplight Annie in a shawl is at a desk writing a letter. At her bureau, Helen in her customary unkept state is tucking her doll in the bottom drawer as a cradle, the contents of which she has dumped out, creating as usual a fine disorder. Annie mutters each word as she writes her letter slowly, her eyes closed to and almost touching the page to follow with difficulty her pen work. And nobody here has attempted to control her. The greatest problem I have is how to discipline her without breaking her spirit. Resolute voice. But I shall insist on reasonable obedience from the start. At which point, Helen, groping about on the desks, knocks over the inkwell. And he jumps up, rescues her letter, writes the inkwell, grabs a towel to stem the spillage, and then wipes at Helen's hands. Helen, as always, pulls free, but not until Annie first gets three letters into her palm. I-N-K, ink. Helen is enough interested in and puzzled by this spelling that she proffers her hand again. So Annie spells impassively, spells and impassively dunks it back into the spillage. Ink, it has a name. She wipes the hand clean and leads Helen to the bureau where she looks for something to engage her. She finds a sewing card with needle and thread and going to her knees shows Helen's hand how to connect one row of holes. Down, under, up, and be careful of the needle. Helen gets it and Annie rises. Fine, you keep out of the ink and perhaps I can keep you out of the soup. She returns to the desk, tidies it, and resumes writing her letter, bent close to the page. These blots are her handiwork. I, she is interrupted by a gasp. <gasps> Helen has stuck her finger and sits sucking at it darkly. Then with vengeful resolve, she sh uh, seizes her doll and is about to dash its brains out on the floor until Annie gives uh, dives, catches it in one hand, which she at once shakes with hop hopping pain, but otherwise ignores patiently. All right, let's try temperance. Taking the doll, she kneels, goes through the motions of kneeling, its head on the floor, spells into to Helen's hand, bad girl. She lets Helen feel the aggrieved expression on her face. Helen imitates it. Next, she makes Helen caress the doll and kiss the hurt spot and hold it gently in her arms, then spells into her hand, good girl. Helen lets Hel She lets Helen feel the smile on her face. Helen sits with a scowl, which suddenly clears. She pats the doll, kisses it, wreathes her face in a large artificial smile and bears the doll to the washstand where she carefully sits it. Annie watches, pleased. Very good girl. Whereupon Helen elevates the pitcher and dashes it onto the floor instead. And he leaps to her feet and stands inarticulate. Helen calmly gropes back to sit at the sewing cart and needle. Annie manages to achieve self-control. She picks up a fragment or two of the pitcher, sees Helen is puzzling over the card, and resolutely kneels to demonstrate it again. She spells into Helen's hand. Kate, meanwhile, coming ar around the corner with folded sheets in her arms, halts at the doorway and watches them for a moment in silence. She is moved, but level. 
What are you saying to her? Annie glances up a bit embarrassed and rises from the spelling to find her company manners. Oh, I was just be making conversation, saying it was a sewing card. But what does that, she imitates with the fingers, mean to her? No, no, she won't know what spelling is till she knows what a word is. Yet you keep spelling to her, why? I like to hear myself talk. The captain says it's like spelling to the fence post. Does he now? Is it? No, it's how I watch you talk to Mildred. Mildred. Any baby. Gibberish. Grown-up gibberish. Baby talk gibberish. Do they understand any word of it to start? Somehow they begin to. If they hear it, I'm letting Helen hear it. Other children are not... impaired. Oh, there's nothing impaired in that head. It works like a mousetrap. But after a child hears how many words, Miss, Sull Miss Annie? A million? I guess no mother's ever minded enough to count. She drops her eyes to spell into Helen's hand, again indicating the card. Helen spells back and Annie is amused. What did she spell? I spelled card, she spelled cake. Annie, or she takes in Kate's quickness and shakes her hand gently. No, it's only a finger game to her, Miss Keller. What she has to learn first is that things have names. And what will, and when will she learn? Maybe after a million and one words? They hold each other's gaze. Kate then speaks quietly. I should like to learn those letters, Miss Annie. I'll teach you tomorrow morning. That makes only half a million each. It's her bedtime. Annie reaches for the sewing card, Helen rejects. Annie insists, and Helen gets rid of Annie's hand by jabbing it with the needle. Annie gasps and tries to grip Helen's wrist, but Kate intervenes with a proffered sweet, and Helen drops the card, crams a sweet into her mouth, and scrambles up to search for her mother's hands for more. Annie nurses her wound, staring after the sweet. I'm sorry, Miss Annie. Why does she get a reward? For stabbing me? Well, then tiredly, we catch our highs with flies with honey, I'm afraid. We haven't the heart for much else, and so many times she simply cannot be compelled. Yes, I'm the same way myself. Kate smiles and leads Helen off around the corner. Annie, alone in her room, picks up things, and in the act of removing Helen's doll, gives way to unmannerly temptation. She throttles it. Like, fake strangles it. She drops it on her bed and stands pondering. Then she turns back, sits decisively, and writes again as the light dims on her. Grimly. The more I think, the more certain I am that obedience is the gateway through which knowledge enters the mind of the child. On the word obedience, a shaft of sunlight hits the water pump outside. While Annie's voice ends in the dark, followed by a distant cock crow, daylight comes up over another corner of the sky, with Viney's voice heard at once. Breakfast ready! Viney comes down into the sunlight beam and pumps a handful of water, pitcher full of water. While the pitcher is brimming, we hear conversation from the dark. The light grows to the family room of the house, where all are either entering or already seated at breakfast, with Keller and James arguing the war. Helen is wandering around the table to explore the contents of other plates. When Annie is in her chair, she watches Helen. Viney re-enters, sets the pitcher on the table. Kate lifts the almost empty biscuit plate with an inquiring look. Viney nods and bears it off back, either of, neither of them interrupting the men. Annie, meanwhile, sits with quiet fork, watching Helen, who at her mother's plate pokes her hand among some scrambled eggs. Kate catches Annie's eyes on her, smiles with a wry gesture, Helen moves on to James' plate, the male, the male can talk continuing, James deferential, and Keller overriding. No, we shouldn't, but shouldn't we give the devil his due, father? The fact is, we lost the South two years earlier when he outfought us behind Vicksburg. Outthought is a peculiar word for a butcher. Harness maker, wasn't he? I said butcher. His only virtue as a soldier was numbers he led them to slaughter with no more regard than for so many sheep. But even if in that sense he was a butcher, the fact is he, and a drunken one half the war, agreed father. If his own people said he was, I can't argue he, well, what is it you find so admiring in such a man, Jimmy, the butchery or the drunkenness? 
neither father, only the fact that he beat us. He didn't. Is your contention we won the war, sir? He didn't beat us at Vicksburg. We lost Vicksburg because Pemberton gave Bragg 5,000 of his cavalry and Loring, whom I knew personally for a nincompoop before you were born, marched away from Champions Hill with enough men to have held them. We lost Vicksburg by stupidity verging on treason. I would have said we lost Vicksburg because Grant was one thing no Yankee general was before him. Drunk? I doubt it. Obstinate. Obstinate. Could any of them com could any of them compare even in that with old Stonewall? If he'd been there, we would still have Vicksburg. Well, the butcher simply wouldn't give him up. He tried four ways of getting around Vicksburg, and on the fifth try, he got around. Anyone else would have pulled north, and he wouldn't have gotten around if we'd had a southerner in command, instead of a half-breed Yankee trader like Pemberton. While this background talk is in progress, Helen is working around the table, ultimately toward Annie's plate. She messes with her hands in James' plate and then in Keller's, both men taking it so for granted they hardly notice. Then Helen comes groping with soiled hands past her own plate to Annie's. Her hand goes in it, and Annie, who has been waiting, deliberately lifts and removes her hand. Helen gropes again. Annie firmly pins her by the wrist and removes her hands from the table. Helen thrusts her hands again. Annie catches them, and Helen begins to flail and make noise. The interruption brings Keller's gaze upon them. What's the matter there? Miss Annie, you see, she's accustomed to helping herself from our plates to anything she... Yes, but I'm not accustomed to it. No, of course not. Viney. Give her something, Jimmy, to quiet her. But her table manners are the best she has. Well, he pokes a cross with a chunk of bacon at Helen's hand, which Helen, Annie releases, but Helen knocks the bacon away and stubbornly thrusts at Annie's plate. Annie grips her wrists again. The struggle mounts. Let her this time, Miss Sullivan. It's the only way we get any adult conversation. If my son's half merits that description, he rises. I'll get you another plate. I have a plate. Thank you. Uh, Viney, I'm afraid that Captain Keller says it's only too true. She'll persist, she'll persist in this until she gets her own way. Viney, bring Miss Sullivan another plate. I have a plate. Nothing's wrong with the plate. I intend to keep it. Silence for a moment, except for Helen's noises as she struggles to get loose. The Kellers are a bit nonplussed, and Annie is too darkly intent on Helen's manners to have any thoughts now of her own. Huh. <laughs> See why they took Vicksburg? Miss Sullivan, one plate or another is hardly any matter to struggle with a deprived child about. Oh, I'd sooner have a more. Helen begins to kick. Annie moves her ankles to the side opposite of the chair. Heroic issue myself. I, no, I really must insist you. Helen bangs her toe on the chair and sinks to the floor, crying with rage and feigned injury. Annie keeps hold of her wrists, gazing down while Kate rises. Now she's hurt herself. No, she hasn't. Will you please let her go? Miss Annie, you don't know the child well enough yet. She'll keep, I know an ordinary tantrum well enough when I see one and a badly spoiled child. Hear, hear. Miss Sullivan. You would have more understanding of your pupil if you had some pity in you. Now kindly do as I... Pity! She releases Helen and turns equally annoyed on Keller across the table. Instantly, Helen scrambles up and dives at Annie's plate. This time, Auntie intercepts her by pouncing on her wrists like a hawk and her temper boils. For this tyrant? The whole house turns on her whim. Is there anything she wants she doesn't get? I'll tell you what I pity when the sun won't rise and set for her all her life. And every day you're telling her it will. What good will your pity do her when you're under the strawberries, Captain Keller? Under the strawberries meaning underground, meaning what happens to her when you die. Kate, for the love of heaven, will you, Annie, Miss Annie, please. I don't think it serves to, to our, sorry, I don't think it serves to lose our, it does you no good, that's all. It's less trouble to feel sorry for her than it is to teach her anything better, isn't it? I fail to see where you have taught her anything, Miss Sullivan. I'll begin this minute if you'll leave the room, Captain Keller. Leave the... Everyone, please. She struggles with Helen while Keller endeavors to control his voice. Miss Sullivan, you are here only as a paid teacher, nothing more. And not to lecture. I can't unteach her six years of pity if you can't stand up to one tantrum. 
Old Stonewall, indeed. Mrs. Keller, you promised me help. Indeed I did. We truly want... I... Then leave me alone with her. Now. Katie, will you come outside with me at once, please? He marches to the front door. Kate and James follow him. Simultaneously, Annie reaches Helen's wrists and the child again sinks to the floor, kicking and crying her weird noises. Annie steps over her to meet Viney, coming into the rear doorway with biscuits and a clean plate, surprised at the general commotion. Heaven's sakes, out, please. She backs Viney out with one hand, closes the door on her astonished mouth, locks it, and removes the key. Keller, meanwhile, snatches his hat from a rack, and Kate follows him down the porch steps. James lingers in the doorway to address Annie across the room with a bow. If it takes all summer, General. Annie, continu uh, Annie comes over to his door in turn, removing her glasses grimly, as Keller outside begins speaking. Annie closes the door on James, locks it, removes the key, and turns with her back against the door to stare ominously at Helen kicking on the floor. James takes his hat from the rack and going down the porch steps joins Kate and Keller talking in the yard, Keller in a spur of ire, in a sputter of ire. This girl is cub of a girl, cub of a girl, presumes. I tell you, I'm out of half a mind to ship her back to Boston before the week is out. You can conform her so from me. I, Captain, she is a hireling. Now I want it clear, unless there's an apology and complete change of manner, she goes back on the next train. Will you make that quite clear? Where will you be, Captain, while I'm making it quite at the office? He begins off left, finds his napkin still in his irate hand, is uncertain with it, dabs his lips with, with dignity, then rides, rids it, <laughs> gets rid of it, a toss to James, and marches off. James turns to eye Kate. Will you? Kate's mouth is set, and James studies it lightly. I thought what she said was exceptionally intelligent. I've been saying it for years. To his face? She comes to relieve him of the white napkin, but reverts again with it. Or will you take it, Jimmy, as a flag? James stalks out with much offended and Kate, turning, stares across the yard at the house, the lights narrowing down to the following pantomime in the family room, leaving her motionless in the dark. We're going to stop there for now because now there's going to be this big, giant, like, six-page scene of just Annie and uh, Kate going at or not Annie and Kate, Annie and Helen going at it. So I will see you in the next video.